you who haven't met me, I think most of the varsity people have. Uh, my name is Shree. Uh, I am an assistant policy coach for Broad Run. Uh, I'm currently a law student uh, at Georgetown and debated at Columbia for um, four years. So uh, that's sort of my background. Um, so every week, I think every Thursday, uh, I'm going to give a lecture and we're also going to have sort of a discussion session um, about sort of affirmatives that you all are debating. Um, one, so it seems like we don't have mics or videos or anything like that. The way that we're going to make this work is if there are any questions, um, have Joey or whoever is, cons whoever is controlling the Broad Run debate account to send a question over the group chat, uh, and I will happily answer it for you. Um, there will be sort of moments where... Uh, you know, you can feel free to do that in between sort of, you know, whatever I'm saying, whatever lecture is going on, as well as um, during the discussion period, which I had originally uh, imagined to be more uh, back and forth. But uh, enough said. Let's uh, start the lecture. So today, um, the topic is all I do is win. So a uh, big sort of focus on this topic is how one can be uh, the best debater that they imagine themselves to be, or the best debater that they can be. Um, so I'm going to start off with a quote. Um, Sun Tzu once said that if you know your enemy and know yourself, um, then you will not be imperiled in a hundred battles. Uh, if you don't know your enemy but do know yourself, uh, you'll win one and lose one. Uh, if you don't know your enemy or yourself, then you will be imperiled in every battle. Uh, I think that sort of piece of advice is something that makes a lot of sense in debates. Uh, that it's important uh, to know not only sort of your, your own strengths and weaknesses, but the strengths and weaknesses of your opponents, as well as sort of the strengths and weaknesses of the judges that you have. So this lecture will be divided into three sections, uh, all necessary qualities to being a successful debater. Section one is knowing yourself. Uh, section two is knowing your opponent. And section three is knowing third parties. So by third parties, I mean judges, other coaches in the community, etc. So let's start with section one, knowing yourself. So I think sort of the foremost um, thing that's important to becoming a good debater is honest goal setting. Honest goal setting. Um, only by creating a goal uh, can you determine sort of the course of action you might take, right? If you go into a debate tournament without any sort of goal in mind, uh, you likely won't do very well because you have no idea what you're striving for. Um, some examples of what goals might look like. You know, some people might want to win JV Metros. I know there, there's sort of a host of you that have been doing pretty well at Wackful tournaments. I've talked to sort of Mr. Richards about this as well. Uh, they have a very good chance of doing pretty well at JV Metros, and I think that's a lot of a goal. Another goal might be winning at the state tournament, right? Uh, the VHSL tournament, uh, there's two teams that can sort of attend, and I think that we have a pretty good shot at winning it, uh, if not, you know, coming in the top four. Uh, another is qualifying to the NCFL or NFL. Uh, the second semester is sort of a busy time for debate, uh, and the NCFL and NFL are sort of big national tournaments uh, that you can potentially qualify to. Uh, I think those qualifiers are held sometime uh, in February or March. Uh, and the last one is win the TOC. Uh, that's obviously sort of a very, you know, far-sighted goal, uh, but, you know, some people are interested in making a big break in national tournaments. Uh, when I say the goal should be honest, so I said honest goal setting, not just goal setting, uh, I don't mean that you shouldn't shoot high, right? It makes sense for you to have sort of high and lofty goals, but I mean, when I say honest, I mean that you should pick goals that you are willing to work for. So, understandably, um, different responsibilities trump, but given sort of uh, your time constraints, your academic responsibilities, your social life, etc., uh, it's important to craft a goal for the year and for the long term and create sort of a plan to execute it. Uh, so, obviously, you know, if you have a ton of SAT classes and do, like, cheerleading and yearbook, it might be difficult for you to have a huge sort of national goal, like win the TOC, but it's certainly possible to have, uh, you know, a goal like do well at the Metro Tournament or qualify to the NCF or NFL, right? Uh, because those are sort of goals that you can potentially achieve. Um, 
there's different ways to motivate yourself towards uh, goals. When I debated, uh, I often put a note in my wallet, a post-it note in my wallet that said the NDT, which is the National Debate Tournament, the biggest tournament in college debate, and it was a nagging reminder for me to do debate work. People have different ways to motivate themselves, uh, and you sort of need to find your own way of reminding yourself of the goal that you set on a regular basis. So the first thing, honest goal setting. The second most important thing is visualizing success. Visualizing success. Uh, I think a lot of people um, thinking that policy debate is a you know heavily research-based and specialized activity think that the most important thing is sort of collecting pieces of evidence or putting them into blocks. Uh, that is incorrect. Uh, the most important sort of thing that you need to do is give practice speeches. It's the single most important factor in success, way more so than research. So the reason why speeches are important uh, is that debate is a speaking activity, not a writing activity, right? No one evaluates whether or not your files are good. Everyone is evaluating whether or not you've executed that file in a suitable fashion. It doesn't really matter if you've cut the cards yourselves, highlighted them, put them in the blocks. You will definitely suck when you first give that speech, which means that you should give multiple practice speeches. A um, couple of examples of you know where this is true. Uh, I think if you went to the George Mason tournament, you debated a lot of Thomas Jefferson teams, right? Um, those teams have a lot of blocks, oftentimes blocks that I've written. That is also a place where I coached previously. Um, but whether or not they're good or bad uh, is not so much the quality of research that they did, but more so whether or not they executed it, right? Whether or not they did any practice tournaments. Uh, you can see that pretty readily. For example, um, Thomas Jefferson, Rashab, and Jay, right, who are in the semifinals of the varsity division, had debates with Richard and Yana before they showed up to the tournament. They did substantially better than any of the other Thomas Jefferson teams did because they actually practiced the speeches that they were about to give. Some other examples. Uh, when I coached Thomas Jefferson, uh, there is a team of Richard Wang and Yana Kaplan that did extremely well um, in the Virginia area. Uh, before they sort of went and did their TOC run, um, I had them focus on the VHSL state tournament. Uh, they gave uh, 24 speeches uh, per month. So they gave 24 speeches in January, 24 speeches in February, March, and April, right? Uh, so by that time, they had approximately 80 to 100 speeches uh, before the state tournament on the affirmative that they were about to break at that state tournament, as well as negative strategies we had prepared for those teams. Doesn't matter how good you are, doesn't matter how good your evidence is, more about sort of practicing speeches. Um, that's also true in our team, I think, too. Uh, Broad Run, DS, and KL um, are pretty okay at debate. Um, they gave a ton of speeches this summer. I think they gave about 100, right? And I think sort of the best example for improvement that you can see is Ritwick, actually. Um, odd that I would say that. Uh, at 11 p.m. every night, uh, you know, regardless of whether he was at debate camp, he gave at least one speech uh, during the summer every day. Uh, that is a lot of speeches, right? Uh, and that's sort of how uh, you know one goes, you know, very quickly from you know middling to you know lower part of the bracket to uh, very high in the bracket. Uh, I think that's sort of how upsets are born as well, right? Uh, Joey and Michael debated the second seeded team at Wake uh, and then beat them uh, because we had 14 speeches on the criticism we're about to go for. Uh, the second seed, the Chambly uh, Charter School, heard that critique for the first time. Uh, DS also beat the second seeded team at um, Georgetown Day because we had 40 speeches on the affirmative while River Hill uh, did not know what a Pacific Islander was. They heard that for the first time, right? Speeches and speech redos are very much an important part of visualizing success. Um, one sort of caveat is you don't even need a coach to do your speeches, right? So uh, obviously it helped that Ritwick and Joey, you know, did speeches in front of me, and you can certainly feel free to, uh, you know, email me and ask me to watch speeches or record them. But you don't even really need a coach to do that. You can make past flows. Uh, make, you know, debate speeches off of those. You can make up your own flows, right? You can craft uh, your own one in season two ACs that you think teams are going to give and then give speeches off of those. But I think 
more than you know taking assignments based off like research assignments or block writing assignments. It's way more important to practice your speeches. That's the fastest way to get better. Um, the second thing is uh, regular and consistent speaking drills. Uh, regular and consistent speaking drills. I think that is important for people who are both, you know, striving towards state and regional success as well as national success. Um, when you don't do speaking drills for a long period of time or never do speaking drills, you don't sound very good because you don't speak on a regular basis, right? You generally, I, my sort of suggestion is, if you are sort of planning to be, a, you know, regionally or competitive, you know, state level, you know, competitive debater, uh, I think it's important for you to do 10 minutes of speaking drills per day, um, whether that be, you know, right when you wake up or right when you sleep or, you know, during a debate meeting or something, right? 10 minutes of speaking drills is important. And I think that sort of lets you maintain that level of speed and clarity during the tournament uh, that other teams will not have. Uh, I think if you're sort of looking towards national tournaments, uh, sort of the time sort of goes up, so it takes about 20 to 30 minutes per day. Uh, I know that Richard uh, Wang, who's the fastest debater that I've had, did about 60 minutes a day. Uh, that's a little absurd, and he probably should have been a little clearer, uh, but it makes sense to do about 20 to 30. Uh, I hope you heard that, DS and Kale, because uh, you all are, uh, you all have some speeches due uh, next week, as well as some speaking drills, things that uh, have not been happening recently. Anyway, uh, the third, uh, the third uh, category is weekly film study. Uh, if you look at sort of the top NFL teams, right, football teams, what do they do on Monday or Tuesday after the tournament? They watch film. They watch themselves play. They watch others play, right? Uh, I think an important part of debate that's often overlooked uh, is the fact that many speeches, for example, rounds that happen at national tournaments as well as sort of national college tournaments and high school tournaments, those are all recorded and put online, right? That's an invaluable resource. Uh, it makes sense, if you plan to get any better a debate, to watch uh, those videos at least, you know, I think I would say one a week. Uh, I will sort of start assigning, like, an optional assignment of weekly suggested film studies that I think will help you do two things. It'll help you get a judge's perspective to honestly reflect on sort of the ethos and clarity of the people that, you know, you're watching. And it also sort of give you tips in terms of how you should debate, right? It gives you sort of people you could mimic or emulate because all of the people who are sort of being recorded are the top sort of distinguished debaters um, that, you know, are going to be, uh, that, that exist, you know, now. Uh, you should also... Uh, sort of speaking of film study, you should also audio record yourself debating. Audio record yourself debating. Um, I know that there are sort of some rules about um, recording video of students, right? But it's certainly acceptable acceptable to audio record yourself when you're giving your own speech, um, as long as you don't sort of like distribute it everywhere, right? It's sort of the best way to the best way to know yourself, right? is to watch yourself. It helps you give, you know, better redos because you know what you screwed up, you know what you did well, and you know how to sort of change the way that, you know, you would give the speech the next time so that you give a more perfect speech, right? It lets you ask questions like, how would you beat yourself? We're psychologically geared to work on things that we're already good at, right? So uh, watching uh, or listening to audio is important because you can figure out what you're good at and what you don't need to work on and what you're bad at and what you do need to work on. For example, Ritwick doesn't need any practice getting faster, right? He needs practice getting clear and making better two in our decisions, right? Everybody has different goals. Everybody has different weaknesses, and you need to identify that. The last sort of section in this category is practicing cross-examination. Practicing cross-examination. Uh, so... Cross-examination is oftentimes an underutilized portion of debate. Obviously, people are not necessarily flowing cross-examination, but it has a lot to do with speaker points. Uh, speaker points are important, uh, everyone. Uh, I know that a bunch of teams that we have are not doing super well on the speaker point side of things. 
Um, be it, you know, maybe they're sort of douchebags in debate, or they just don't, they just straight up don't sound good, right? Uh, a lot of that has to do with the demeanor that you have in cross sex. The quality of the answers that you're giving in cross sex, or the quality of questions you're asking in cross sex, right? Cross sex is sort of a thing that you can practice with, uh, you know, KL and DS as well, right? Joey and Michael, I think, are incredibly good at cross sex, and they're probably better than anyone on this team right now. Uh, I think practicing cross sex lets them get better speaker points oftentimes, right? Joey lately has been scoring, you know, somewhere in between 10 and uh, 20 in terms of speaker awards in national tournaments. So practicing cross sex is important. It also gives you sort of the credibility in front of judges uh, that you are, in fact, more knowledgeable than the other team. Thomas Jefferson, right, reads a lot of blocks. They read a lot of bad arguments. If you can dismantle them in cross X, they no longer have a credible argument coming out of the 2A seat, right, which means that sort of that there is an importance in practicing those kinds of cross Xs. Um, practicing cross X is pretty easy. Uh, the way you do it is you find another person and have them either ask questions about your argument or you ask questions about theirs. Uh, doesn't really get much... You know, harder than that. I know that DS and KL do this pretty regularly amongst themselves. Um, okay. The third uh, thing underneath uh, visualizing, uh, or sorry, the third thing underneath uh, knowing yourself is to have a sense of urgency. Have a sense of urgency. Uh, second semester is go time for debate, right? It's uh, February uh, is basically an onslaught of tournaments, one after another. There's the you know, Hensbury tournament, which is at the end of January. There's the Harvard tournament for people that are going. There's also the state sort of uh, qualifiers as well as metros coming up. Uh, March is even worse, right? So these are the months that sort of matter for debate. Um, every sort of national qualifier and state tournament exists then. Uh, and I think you need to keep in mind uh, at some times that there are only so many times that you can debate in high school. It's rather fleeting. Uh, and success in debate is sort of a referendum on how much you want it uh, and how you have executed executed your plan for victory, right? So whether you took time to visualize your victories, whether you took you know took time to set goals. Uh, so it's important to have a sense of urgency. Um, the next category. So we did knowing yourself. The next category is knowing your opponent. Knowing your opponent. If you, you know, know your own argument, so let's say, uh, you know, you really understand the EPA to set, or you really understand the Norn OK, but you have no idea what the other team is about to say, you're probably about to win 50% of your debates. You'll probably go 2-4 or 3-3 at a six-round tournament and most likely lose it in the first game, right? Uh, so knowing your competition is important. There's So there's a couple of sort of categories, right? To know your competition, there are sort of three categories, I think, of people. There are people who are better than you at debate. These are people that are potentially older and more experienced, but generally have more talent, right? Uh, and, you know, you have to be honest with yourself, right? It's not just about what you who you think is better. It's about what the numbers are. So, for example, uh, Wilson FP, I think, in my mind, uh, is not, you know, particularly better than Kale, but there are definitely two wins ahead of them, right? So, clearly, you need to have an honest evaluation of your competition. The second category is those who are equal to you. Those who are equal to you. These are people who are going to be in the same bracket. So a uh, good example is for Broad Run, you know, AN, right, Anshul and uh, Javeria. Uh, for the George Mason tournament, that would be teams like Thomas Jefferson NP, Thomas Jefferson LS, uh, Oakton BK, right, these are teams that you're about as good as, uh, right, and that you can win one and lose one against. The last is those who you know are better than, you are better than. So teams that you literally do not have to work to win against, right? Uh, knowing this is important. Being able to categorize this is important. Uh, obviously, you know, you need to know who's better than you and who's equal than you, equal to you, so that you know who to write strategies against. On the other hand, do you need to write a strategy against the Woodbridge High School? Absolutely. So being honest about sort of knowing your competition is important. 
the second sort of thing under knowing your competition is that you should write specific strategies against everyone in the equal to you and better than you category. Write specific strategies against everyone in the equal to you and better than you category. So I started coaching uh, in the Virginia area in 2012 at Thomas Jefferson. Uh, they were pretty terrible at debate. Let's not lie. They were going like one, they were going like one at Wackful, and they were having a tough time. They did not win many debates. Um, for the Metro Finals tournament, uh, we crafted three new affirmatives, uh, one versus each one of the top teams, which was, at the time, Broad Run, Chad and Cooper, Broad Run, uh, Wardak and Luke, and Briarwood's Mikey and partner. Uh, honestly, I don't remember the partner. Mikey was sort of the better half of that team. And negative strategies versus sort of every team that was there. Uh, TJ managed to beat Chad and Cooper and split with Mikey. At States, we did similar things. We crafted two new affirmatives, and each uh, sort of member did 42 speeches, 21 half and 21 neg before attending. They closed out. Uh, before TJ won Pensbury, we had specific strategies against literally every single team. There were one NCs to every affirmative on the wiki that was already created, and oftentimes two NC extensions to all of those one NCs, right? Parts of the problem with sort of the way that we prep right now is that I think we have an over-dependence on sort of just the generics that, you know, for example, I put out. So, yes, obviously the Dorn OK applies to a generic set of arguments. The EPA to set also applies to a generic That should not be your specific strategy with specific links against particular teams. So, you know, I think, you know, for example, uh, Broad Run AN is likely to debate TJNP and Oakton BK on a regular basis. That those are teams that they're 50-50 against. We should not just be going for a donor against them, uh, right? We should be going for specific strategies that we have cut against them. They're specific to their app. We should be reading, for example, against Oakton, right? We should be reading evidence about VOTS, which is the type of offshore wind that they use, or have sort of specific pieces of evidence. Not really enough to just be like, much wow, simulation is in our passivity, Adorno 72, let's hope we can win again, right? Because that's unlikely to work. Uh, the second sort of thing under knowing uh, your opponent is understanding argument asymmetries. Uh, argu understanding argument asymmetries. Well, the term argument asymmetry just means sort of uh, different uh, factors about positions and arguments that give you an edge. Different factors about positions they give you an edge. Uh, I know that's pretty vague, but I'll sort of talk about this and break this down. So, uh, the most important thing here is to work smarter and not harder, right? Investing your opponents by identifying content weaknesses. Um, that requires generics for the worse than you category, and then a crutch for when your specific strategy versus a good team falls apart. So, in terms of the worst in you category, right? You can probably win on anything. You can win on the EPA to set. You can win on a door no. You do not need a super specific strategy against teams that honestly are, you know, not super prepared. On the other hand, uh, you need a specific, you know, like I said before, you need a specific strategy versus a good team. But you also need some sort of position that you are comfortable going for. There's a couple of ways to do this, I think. Um, one is sort of specializing in a K triangulation. Specializing in a K triangulation. Uh, what I mean by that is, I think you should specialize in three, so three different critiques um, that come from different literature bases. So, a good example of this, I think, is uh, KL or DS, right? We have the debility slash the settlerism critique for policy teams that are straight up. We have the, you know, the uh, audacity of nope slash what I forgot what we call our uh, refu uh, refusal. Uh, so we have refusal for K teams, uh, and we have you know psychoanalysis or settlerism for uh, soft left affirmatives. Right. Similar things need to be done for yourself. So you need to pick three Ks from different literature bases that apply to the entirety of any affirmative. Good example for your K triangulation might be CAP. Right. I think Javeria knows this already, but you obviously can link CAP to almost every affirmative on the topic. It's invaluable in a sense because you always have something to say. But 
uh, you know, remember, you should have a K triangulation, not a K, you know, one point, right? You need three points to make a triangle. You should make three Ks. Uh, one might be, let's say, so you pick the cap K for critical teams. Fair enough. Uh, maybe it is worth looking into some variety of security for policy teams, right? Uh, or, you know, some version of, let's say, like Afro-pessimism for soft left teams, right? So it makes sense for you to sort of create a triangulation of three different critiques that you can fall back on when your specific strategy fails. One sort of good example of this, um, so a lot of times when I debated, uh, I had a strategy that was more or less 5 to sometimes 12 off. Uh, that is a mistake, don't do that. But uh, given that that was what, what was being done, there were a couple of strategies that were hyper-specific to the F. So, for example, we debated a Kansas team that talked about concentrated animal feeding operations, uh, which was the topic in 2008. It was agricultural subsidies. We had several dis ads and counter plans that were specific to the F, but we also had sort of a Baudrillard criticism that was, you know, applicable all the time, right, that we knew a lot about uh, that, you know, we could go for. Uh, and in that debate, all of our specific strategies fell uh, flat. They were super prepared to debate them, so we had to fall back. We won on the sort of the fallback position, so it's important to have that specialization. The reason why I think specializing in a K triangulation is important is because Ks, you know, oftentimes evolve, but K answers rarely do. If the K answers are static, you know, their answers are hella predictable, uh, which means that there's an argument asymmetry, right? You can predict all the things that they're going to say, uh, but their sort of answers are going to be bad. So that's one example. Um, the second example, if you're not a K person, is topicality. I think topicality is the great equalizer. Uh, the reason why I say this is because no one has, like, blocked out topicality arguments beyond the 1 in C or the 2 AC, right? Um, one sort of example of this is when Thomas Jefferson debated a T argument uh, against a, you know, fairly unprepared but okay team. Uh, we lost uh, because we had a 2 AC block to T. There is no such thing as a 1AR block to T because it requires organic answers to their analytics, and then we got stopped, right? And that's sort of the... Uh, that, uh, hold on one second. Give me about... Uh, give me that. Sorry about that. So T is sort of a great equalizer that lets you sort of leverage against teams that are well prepared and have lots of blocks, right? And that's sort of a way that uh, you can create an argument asymmetry because the coach and there's no such thing as like a coach in the room that writes blocks organically to the analytics that the other teams are making, right? So T is sort of a good way to do that. Uh, another way is sort of forming picks against high reps teams. So for example, uh, teams that are on the same level, like Oakton, BK for Broad Run Ann, right, uh, or the Thomas Jefferson team, you should be making picks uh, out of their affirmatives. They, their plan texts are written terribly, uh, as we will talk about in a second, uh, which will let you sort of create counter plans to solve almost 100% of the case. That makes it very difficult for them to win. Okay, the last sort of category under knowing your opponent is block writing and highlighting. Uh, so one thing that we do poorly on this team is we have a 1NC, uh, where we have a 1AC, uh, but that sort of, the and then we potentially have two AC blocks, and then that's it. Uh, there's no vision beyond what's going to happen in the 1NC, like we don't have any 2NC or 1NR extensions of anything looking at UDS and Kale uh, for any of the teams at Pensbury, please fix that, uh, as well as sort of affirmative stuff, right? There's no 1AR extensions to any of these 2AC arguments, et cetera. So there needs to be some amount of time that's spent on block writing. Obviously, it's more important to practice speeches, I think, uh, and your execution, but it's also important to put together files that make sense. Okay, so we went over knowing yourself and knowing your opponent. The third category is knowing third parties. Uh, knowing third parties. Third parties include uh, judges as well as coaches and other people on uh, other teams. So I think there's sort of two segments to that. First is developing your strong ties. 
So you should use your coaches, like Mr. Uh, Richards and Mr. Dudding, as well as alums, uh, as a resource. There are a lot of alums from Broad Room Debate that now debate, for example, James Madison, right? You can talk to Nick Lepp or talk to Wardak about arguments. These are people who are relatively smart. They can give you advice uh, when you need it. Uh, the important thing to sort of consider, though, is that you should be asking coaches for confirmation and not introduction to your arguments. So ask coaches for confirmation and not introduction. Coaches should not be treated like Wikipedia, right? You should not, you know, send me emails like, what is the politics to set? Uh, we generally expect sort of, you know, some amount of you attempting to try uh, before you ask the question. So uh, when you sort of develop your strong test with coaches and alums, you should do whatever you can and then from there, you know, ask questions. The second thing that I think you all uh, need to work on is developing your weak ties. So ties with judges and coaches at other schools, etc. Um, one sort of problem that I've seen with speaker points is that we, uh, some of us have a reputation of being assholes. Um, the people you're an asshole to will tell their coaches who will shut you down in key debates. Uh, you will lose. You will also get like 23 speaker points. Those are things that should not happen, right? Rumors travel fast in big communities. Don't screw up. Don't be an ass. Uh, the second and I think sort of you know, more concrete thing is you should have a strategy for contacting your judges to offer improvements. Right? You should have a strategy for contacting your judges to offer improvements. You generally should be asking the emails of the judges that you have so that you have follow-up questions about sort of the debates that you have. Um, these questions should not just be like, how do I win and why, are, why did I get a 23 at the end? Um, they should have sort of, you know, there should, they should be more targeted questions, right? So you might be like, you know, would it be persuasive to make X argument instead of Y? Uh, do you think sort of, uh, you know, too much time is spent on X and there needs to be more impact work done on something? You know, or sort of ethos pointers, right? Like, do you think, uh, you know, clarity and speed were lacking, right? Specific sort of targeted questions will get decent, you know, responses from your judges, and your judges will know that you are uh, wanting to improve and thus are more likely to care. Um, the last is you should sustain a relationship to your lab leaders. Um, hopefully, uh, KL and DS did their job, and they, uh, set, they should have given you a flyer about debate camps. If they have not, you should ask them to do so immediately after this lecture. Um, sustaining a relationship to your lab leaders at camp is important because uh, those lab leaders oftentimes judge debates, and they can also give you good advice about the arguments that you might read, and you might even, you know, continue to connect with them throughout the year. So it's important to sort of sustain a relationship either through email or, you know, some other means, right, uh, so that you can always have them as a resource. Okay, uh, any questions about the lecture? Again, you should ask the question to Joey so that Joey can just type it in, or Joey can just type in there are no questions. Um, good question, Jeraria. How do you evaluate when a judge gives you good or bad advice? Uh, well, um, a couple of ways. Uh, you can double check with me, right? Uh, you can be like, hey, this is advice that X judge gave me. Um, is it credible slash is it something that I should implement? And I will probably give you an answer that's not just like a yes or no, but we'll, I'll probably like try to develop the... Uh, you know, I'll probably try to explain to you what the judge probably meant. Um, the other thing is, I think you should also be fairly confident about the way that, you know, you argue, right? This is not to say you should be arrogant or never take in constructive criticism, but it's important to have sort of a grounding in the way that you think arguments should be developed. So if they, if you, if they, if you think that their advice is weird, right, you might ask questions about that advice, you know, not in the sense of, like, are you dumb? But you should ask them for, like, you know, how do you think that, um, you know, can be, 
you know, done in this debate, right? And maybe they'll give you a specific way to say their argument, which will make it more clear, right? Sometimes judges are sort of, it's not so much that judges are trying to give you, like, bad advice, but it's that judges are sort of not great at explaining what they mean, right? So asking and pushing them uh, about, you know, how that might, you know, be implemented in a debate is a good way to go uh, and figure out whether or not the, you know, judge is giving you advice that you think you want. Regardless, though, I think that even if they're giving bad advice, it's also important to know that those judges are going to be in the back of the room constantly, and even if they're bad judges, you're going to get them, which means that you need a way to persuade those bad judges that you were listening to your to their previous commentary, right? Uh, so it's still important to sort of write down the advice that the judge has given you, no matter how much you disagree. Uh, next question, I guess. Uh, how often should you practice debates? Well, um, as often as possible. <laughs> um, you know, I, obviously people have, like, different time commitments, and it's oftentimes kind of difficult to produce or practice debate, right? It seems like DS is constantly bored, but everybody else has, like, a real life. Um, you should do practice debates as much as you can, but I think what's more important is doing sort of practice speeches on your own. So you got, you know, so Chal... Right, you got a bunch of flows from your previous debates. P.S. If you have not saved your flows, you should start saving your flows uh, from debates. Right, you should take those flows or create sort of your own flows. So create your own one and C and two ACs that you can use speeches for. Um, I think that's sort of a better way of, of you know using your time because practice debates oftentimes take like an hour and a half, two hours two and a half hours of people are, like, stealing egregious amounts of prep time, uh, while speeches uh, you can finish. If you did, like, two speeches a day, that's, like, 20 minutes max, right? Um, so I think that it's probably more important to do speeches. If you have time to do practice debates, go for it. I obviously would not say no, uh, but there may be better ways to sort of figure out how you personally can get better as well. Next question. Uh, are there drips, uh, drills to do to improve ethos? Um, yes. Uh, kind of. Uh, so, two things. Um, a lot of ethos is about out-of-round stuff, so, you know, it has to do with the credibility of the speaker. It also has to do with sort of, uh, you know, are you liked, right? Uh, so that's obviously not a drill. That's more like being a reasonable, nice human being in real life. Uh, so that's not, I mean, I guess if you need to, like, you know, practice pretending like you're a good person, that would be great. Um, but hopefully you don't need to do that. Um, but in terms of within debates, there's sort of two things that you should be doing. I think speaking drills are important, right? Uh, to judge it, you know, judges hate debaters who are super unclear uh, and do not, you know, it's hard to flow that. It's hard to have any sort of credibility when you sound not great and mush mouthy, right? Uh, so it's more to do speaking drills with a focus and with an emphasis on clarity, um, not so much speed. You should be speaking at the fastest rate that you can that is maintaining the same clarity uh, that you do in normal speaking, right? The second is sort of speeches. Uh, so, for example, uh, Ritwick did a bunch of speeches this summer uh, where his focus was to improve things like judge connection. So he's pretty quick, right? He could make, like, 70 arguments if he felt like it in the, in the 2 and R, but that's not something that's super successful, especially against teams that have a high amount of pathos, so a high amount of emotion in their argument or a high amount of persuasiveness, right? So it's also important to figure out, you know, when are times that you need to slow down to make a point, what, you know, sorts of words should you put emphasis on, right? So um, doing these speeches and figuring out sort of places where you can, you know, give emphasis and whatnot is important. Uh, the third is, I think, audio recording yourself. Um, generally, you tend to be the worst critic of yourself, so if you listen to yourself and you don't sound persuasive at all, um, you should 
think about why that is the case and then try to fix that and then audio record again, see if you've improved. And I think audio recording is sort of a big part of the drills to improve your ethos or pathos in the base. Next question. Uh, how do you prep for people not on the wiki? Uh, two simple answers. One is an Intel sheet. Um, we have done terribly on that. Uh, so KL and DS, let's uh, let's figure out how to coordinate Intel sheets. The way that this works is essentially, you know, Broad Run is more than half of the field at almost every tournament, right? Or is at least half, which means that literally every debater has debated every other debater at the tournament. Um, once the tournament, you know, once Every round is over. Teams should be keeping an intel sheet, which has sort of details of what teams have been reading on the affirmative or the negative, right? So for the affirmative, you should be writing stuff like plan text, the advantages, even, you know, tricks that they have in the 2AC or tricks that they have in the 2NC, right? Uh, same with the negative. The negative should be identifying what the positions are that they read, and then any sort of 2NC and 2NR shenanigans that they pulled, you know? Do they do badly when they answer conditionality? Right? These are all sort of questions that are important on the Intel sheet. Um, the second is um, you should make friends. Um, when you are debating people who are not on the wiki, so these are, I think these are actually not super duper common anymore. Uh, it's like a bunch of, you know, uh, bad Oakton teams, a couple of, you know, Woodbridge teams, and a bunch of, like, other bad teams. Um, you should ask your friends who have debated them, which you can figure out through ballots, right? Mr. Richards and Mr. Dunning consistently get, uh, you know, who debated, you know, they get a list of wins and losses from the tournaments, from Wackful, right? Uh, so from there, you can figure out who has debated those teams and then ask them. The likelihood is that you have made at least a friend or two, or if you're bad at making friends, hopefully Joey because only Joey probably has made friends in the last month, right? Maybe as Joey, these you know what these who these you know who these people are and what they're reading, and I think that's sort of a good way to do prep against people not on the wiki. Uh, the other thing is people who are not on the wiki are usually bad. Um, they are probably just reading a camp case, which means that doing case next to camp affirmatives, which I think uh, Rahul did early in the semester, uh, should actually um, do pretty okay against these teams. Next question. Um, oh, I think he said that he had to go do something today. Um, you should ask him, though. I thought, I thought he said that on Facebook. I'm not sure. Uh, oh, really? Uh, yeah, I mean, I know that, uh, you know, Loyola and Harvard are doing the dumb camp thing, uh, so two sort of points about that. Yes, um, Brad and Jack are smart, uh, but the stuff that they're teaching is probably not going to help you in a Wackful or a Metro's debate. Uh, so think about the judges that you're about to get. So you're about to get a bunch of George Mason novices and JME people who hate the K who are going to watch you try to be Jack Ewing, losing strategy. Um, I think that, and it's also going to be super expensive because it's at Harvard. So unless you're like good, good, um, highly not recommended. Uh, I would actually though, recommend you to go to debate camp. Uh, I think that if you have time at all, so if you're not doing like governor school or an internship or something that conflicts with debate camp, you should do debate camp. Um, my sort of suggestion for those who are more nationally inclined uh, are either sort of the dark bathroom camps. I think those camps are good for that. Uh, and I think if you're seeking a more regional um, you know, experience, I would say the JMU um, camp, which is, you know, where I often work at, or if not me, Nick will probably work at, uh, Nick Lab, that is. Uh, or sort of, you know, even even the digital debate camp stuff, which happens online, uh, which you can do if you have governor school, right? Those are all sort of good options. I think the option that you have suggested right now is uh, not the greatest one. Next question.
how should you choose your K triangulation? Good question. Um, I think it's partly based off of your comfortability level, but it's mostly based off of your it's mostly based off of the ability to apply to every affirmative. So when you pick three Ks, it should damn well apply to every affirmative that you might ever debate, right? So, um, you know, the cap K that you read, Javeria, is actually a pretty good example of this because the cap K covers a large swath of affirmatives. It covers, uh, you know, soft left affirmatives because they might still be, you know, cap their you know version of exploration development might still be based in capitalism. It certainly links to policy action, a question, and it links to critical affirmatives that don't talk about capitalism, right? There's a very small amount of literature that does like that never links to the cap K. Uh, so once you do that, you're like, oh, well, so I need, like, two more Ks to figure out the sort of niche that the cap K doesn't cover. So let's say you only want to read the cap K against K teams, and you just really don't want to do that against policy teams because you don't want to get into a huge impact or debate, and you... You know, you think that there's sort of a better way to deal with uh, K teams that some K teams that talk about like capitalism pretty specifically. So then there's two categories, right? There's a policy teams K category and like a very wanky weird like actually talks about capitalism K team K, right? So for the policy team, you might pick something uh, that's more security based, right? Judges are not going to be confused by security K. Uh, there are also specific links to advantages that are out, which I think will be pretty good. They work a lot with sort of the other K arguments that you already have in the Dropbox, right? So even sort of the, you know, Adorno nonsense that we have as well as, you know, the chronopolitics stuff that you have, etc. These all work quite well with security arguments. So the I think, I think you should invest in some variant of security K, whether it be the chrono argument or, like, a Nietzsche-based security argument, or like a just like a very straight-up security argument. The third category is probably like slightly more high theory. So let's say, so you have like a very hard line cap K. You might pick sort of a critique that's more based on contingency. So against teams that make very strong identity claims or class-ish claims, right? So these are examples like the Wilderson affirmative that says that you know America should never exist, you know, at all costs. Uh, or, you know, stuff that's like, that takes a more hardline stance against Neolib, right? You might have a critique um, that criticizes sort of those hardline stances. Uh, I know that the K that uh, DS and KL like are sort of like the Bartleby uh, critique or the carpentry stuff that's on the Dropbox, but essentially a variation of that. So you basically just got to figure out, you know, have you got all of your cases covered? Uh, and if the answer is yes, then you have created an effective K-triangulation. What the content of that K-triangulation is is largely inconsequential as long as it applies to all the things. Next question. Uh, the other thing I want to add is that it doesn't always have to be a K triangulation, so obviously some people don't like the K, right? Uh, it would be very stupid to go for the K in every debate, so it's sort of the same discussion of, you know, you can read topicality arguments as well as pick arguments, right? Stuff that's strategic and creates argument asymmetry is important. So, you know, if you like the K, you know, go for it, but there are obviously times when you need to adapt to judges who hate it, uh, which happens on a semi-regular basis, so like. Um, Yoshida, uh, what speaking drill should we do? Uh, or, uh, I think it depends on sort of uh, skill level, too. I think if you're going to do 10 minutes of speaking drills, right, if you're trying to be regionally or sort of state competitive, um, I think you should try to do sort of a forward speaking drill that essentially does the 1A, that essentially speaks the 1AC and the 1NC with the most clarity and speed that you can. And you can sort of slowly build speed. The way that you should do this is by trying to read more and more words ahead, which will cause you uh, to naturally get a little quicker, right? Uh, so that's sort of my suggestion for the 10-minute version, is to essentially do forward drills for the... 1AC and 1, you know, if you're the 1A, you might do 1AC and 2NC block type stuff. If you're a 1N, you might do the 1NCs and 
the two A's, uh, right? The two AC blocks, the two air blocks, things like that. So stuff that you're going to read on a pretty regular basis, you should have, you know, you should have a lot of drills done on this. The uh, in terms of the people who have loftier goals, uh, you that sort of depends on your strengths and weaknesses. Um, so Joey and Michael are slow, which means that they should be doing drills where they try to weed and read ahead, right? Uh, Ritwick and Rahul are fast but unclear, which means that they should do like enunciation drills. So you know you sort of need to honestly evaluate yourself: is your big problem that you're slow or that you're unclear or both, and then try to create drills that remedy them. Um, if you ask KL and DS, they will have decent examples of you know, what to do when you're unclear and also what to do when you need to speed up, so. Next question. Sure. Um, so Javeri asks, what is the best thing to look for when making a 2 and R choice? Um, that's a difficult question that oftentimes depends a lot on experience. I can tell you what not to look for, uh, which I think is actually somewhat important. You should not look for, you should not ink chase. So one bad thing, bad habit that people get in is they'll be like, there were three answers on the politics to said and ten answers on the criticism, so I picked the politics to said. Uh, the problem with that strategy is that perhaps one of those three arguments on the politics to set is just like factually accurate and true and really persuasive, while well, all ten of the answers on the critique were horrible, right? Uh, when you ink chase, you'll lose because you'll they will ultimately win on one good argument. Uh, when sort of I debated, oftentimes we undercovered specific arguments in the one AR to try to bait the two NR to ink chase. So, uh, for example, Word picks are dumb arguments, and the one AR we spent very little time on them. The two NR often went for them, and we laughed them out of the room. Right? Don't be that person. The I think the most important thing to look for is that you need to do a couple of things in the two NR. Right? It needs there needs to be a, a couple of goals. One is that you need to neutralize the case in some way. You either need to win a substantial amount of defense on an advantage they're reading, either impact or internal link defense. Right? Maybe both. Uh, or sort of case turns or solvency turns, right, that imply that the affirmative has failed at solving the advantages they've suggested. So that's part one. Part two is that you need some sort of external offense. So you need an offense that um, the case that, you know, they read does not solve. So there's a lot of examples of this. So, for example, if you read the EPA to said, right, they do not have... You know, there's no way the affirmative solves the mobile basin extinction scenario because it's in a river, not the ocean. Uh, there's that's an external impact that you can, you know, isolate alongside case arguments. So it makes sense to read this end case. Or if you're reading a K, right? There's no way the affirmative solves for capitalism. Hopefully, uh, so you have, you know, capitalism leads to, um, you know, wars and their environment advantage doesn't solve. So you just need to make sure that sort of the strategy you're going for is coherent. So it needs to take out the F somehow, like you need to discount the relevance of the affirmative, and you need to make an argument that they don't, you, then you need to make an impact claim that they do not solve. And as long as the position that you're going for does that, you know, successfully, then you have made a decent two in our choice. I take it that is the last question from Joey. Is that correct? Great. Uh, next 30 minutes is discussion. Uh, so kind of unfortunate that we do not have a mic because I would have liked to go back and forth. So I don't know how we can figure this out, Joey, but uh, let's figure something out at some point. Um, but the second section is sort of talking about two specific apps that we'll see at Pensbury uh, and other places that, um, and we're going to sort of identify its weaknesses one by one. Uh, for the discussion sections, I do not have stuff every week yet. So, oh, uh, what am I waiting for exactly?
Uh, Jerry, are we good? I'm not sure what I'm waiting for. You told me to wait. Oh, um, okay then. Uh, so I'm going to hit screen share. There's a argument on the wiki that I would like to talk about, uh, I think. Okay, that's fine. Okay, uh, can everybody see the... Uh, can everybody see the wiki in front of me? Yes, no, Joey. Is the screen share working right now? Okay, good. Um, so we're going to talk today about soft left affirmatives and identify sort of the weaknesses of those soft left affirmatives. Um, if there is a particular position that you would like us to collectively take apart, right, in a discussion group, that's essentially what we're going to do between, like, 5 and 5.30. Um, so you can feel free to stay for those, or you can feel free, you know, to go whenever, uh, obviously. Um, the reason why I picked this affirmative is because Bronx Science has, like, six teams going to Pensbury, and it's also very similar to the affirmative that Oakton likes to read, the VATS affirmative, uh, so I sort of want to talk about the ways is that you can figure out the weaknesses of the F. So the first thing that you should do when you construct a case negative or figure out negative arguments is to figure out what the plan text is. So the plan uh, is right here, right? The United States federal government should substantially increase its development of decentralized offshore wind energy projects located in the United States territorial waters. Uh, the sort of next thing that you should look at is to see uh, what the advantage is that they have isolated and whether they've solved that advantage. So let's scroll up a little bit. So there's two advantages that they've isolated, right? Um, the first is this environmental injustice advantage. Uh, they say that the United States relies exclusively on fossil fuels for energy, which leads to CO2 emissions, uh, and that those uh, you know, plants are oftentimes put next to minority and low-income communities that experience pollution, right? Uh, and then it's like coal pollution kills a lot of people. So that's the first advantage. Uh, then there's a bunch of impact framing cards, which is this section. The next one is that there's sort of grassroots movements that are spurring this that says the plan shifting of the scale of energy decision making spurs movements and that empirically leads to successful grassroots movements against environmental injustice of elites, etc. So essentially it's an affirmative about uh, environmental injustice and coal pollution on minority communities. Um, the very first thing that you should think about when you are negative is whether or not the affirmative solves the advantages that, you know, they have suggested. Uh, so what they do is they create uh, offshore, decentralized offshore wind, which essentially means, uh, you know, there's not like a big energy company that centralizes, you know, energy in a grid. It's essentially uh, decentralized uh, wind energy sort of stations that exist for each sort of household, essentially. Um, would, why would that plan not solve for environmental injustice? And Joey can feel free to type the answers of whoever here in the chat. Uh, sure, how so? What, what do you mean by no spillover? Yeah, so yeah, so there can be good arguments about why other countries wouldn't model. So think about it this way, right? There is no plausible way that decentralized offshore wind, which is basically like each house having its own little like windmill that produces energy, uh, is going to you know solve sort of the CO2 emissions that say are devastating for everybody in the status quo. Uh, one example is things like car pollution or 
you know, ch you know, pollution from China, right? Having a couple of wind stuff installed on your house is not going to solve sort of the major problems of pollution that exist now. So that sort of lets you make solvency arguments, right? Alternative causality arguments uh, that shut down the F. One important thing to remember is that you do not need evidence to make these sorts of solvency arguments. It would be nice to have evidence, right? But, you know, the world is not perfect. We do not have all, you know, evidence of all varieties. Uh, but it makes sense to have sort of analytical presses uh, of the solvency of the affirmative uh, in these debates. Uh, the reason why is having arguments for why offshore wind fails, right, uh, to solve the advantage, will let you win, for example, that the dissat outweighs the poverty advantage that they suggest, or uh, that, you know, there's a counter plan that can solve the issues of pollution better. China should do something about the, you know, pollutants that they put in the air, right? It sort of gives you, it generates a lot of, um, it generates enough defense so that it makes all of your other uh, you know, off-case arguments into actual, you know, arguments that sort of seem like they have some relevance to the affirmative. So solvency is the very first question that you should be looking at. Uh, the next sort of thing that you need to identify is impact level tricks. So one problem that we have is we sort of look at the 1AC, we're, we usually ask the question, so during pre-round prep somebody will show up and be like, hey, um, what uh, is your advantage? And somebody will be like, econ. Uh, and then we'll be like, oh, okay, great. And then we'll think that that was like an ad adequate response to the question, right? You need to actually have them tell you what the internal links of the econ advantage are, right? So it's like, how do you, you know, can you tell us what the internal link to econ is or what the impact to your argument is, right? Uh, because those arguments oftentimes change the way that these arguments are debated. One good example is if I was just like, you know, the advantage that I'm reading in this debate is, uh, you know, CO2 emissions, I would probably read the wrong set of impact arguments. They're making a ton of sort of impact claims, right? They're like, uh, so you can see sort of the Faber and McCarthy evidence. They're like mainstream environmental organization activism is dominated by experts of racial, economic, and gender privilege. Overcoming this exclusive form of political organizing uh, requires decentralized movements, right? So they make arguments that are like big stick impacts are dominated by experts who have, you know, different sorts of privilege. They read this virtual piece of evidence that's like uh, environmental injustice, you know, outweighs anything or probability and magnitude. They make this argument that, you know, we should challenge short-term catastrophe focus, right? These are arguments that need to be answered in some manner, at least at some point in the debate, right? And hopefully in the 1NC, and if you don't catch them early enough, you need to answer them in the 2NC. Uh, the reason is you'll lose in two ways. You'll either lose that their impact is more important uh, than the, for example, the EPA to set or the sacred cow to set that has an extinction impact, right? Uh, which means that you need sort of defensive arguments against those impact claims. You need a util argument. You need arguments that experts, you know, might have privilege, but they certainly are not making the right predictions. You probably need pieces of evidence that say magnitude is an important concern and that we need to make sort of short-term, uh, quick, uh, analyses of extinction, right? These are cards that you probably need to have in order for you to win your dissent. It's also the same with sort of critique debates, too, because they can sort of win, uh, the, if they win, for example, a lot of their impact framing arguments, it sort of makes it difficult for you to win the link to your critique, right? So if they're like, if you read like the race K for some reason, right, you say the state is bad, etc., they'll make arguments that are just like we made, you know, a racially conscious attempt to solve you know, environmental injustice, right? Which means that you need to somehow stop the affirmative from winning leverage of their F. And one way to do that is by putting defense a lot of, on a lot of their impact level tricks. So, you know, solvency, takeouts and turns, as well as impact level tricks. So that's the second thing. The third is to see sort of what the plan text does and to see whether the plan text is sufficient uh, is either sufficient to see us solve the F or, you know, there's a plan flaw or whatever. So let's let's look at the plan. The plan is the United States Federal Government should substantially increase its development of decentralized offshore wind energy projects uh, located in the United States territorial waters. So uh, the first question there is, uh, you know, is there a topicality violation you can read against this affirmative? Thoughts? Really? T. Oceans? Was that Ritwick? Oh, 
Okay, that's a little better than that's a little better than what I had expected that to be. Yeah, maybe territorial waters means lakes. Although I think I think I'm not 100% that that's true. I think so. Today I looked at sort of U.S. code for that, uh, and I think the term coastal waters might actually you know potentially include the Great Lakes, but I'm not sure the territorial you know, waters does. That that's a question mark. That's a maybe, at all. Um, what else? Okay, YT development. Whoever that said that. He doesn't know. Uh, good. Uh, thanks, Red. Uh, uh, T it. Um, y T it. Oh, okay. Um, so I do actually think T development is a thing. Um, like, I think it's actually possible to be, like, you do not mine anything from the ocean. You literally just attach, like, a float. You essentially attach a floating, you know, fan on the, on you know, on the, in the sky on top of an ocean that's decentralized, that's not connected to your grid, right? Uh, that is not developing the ocean in any way. Uh, that is just getting energy from the air. Uh, sorry, not development. Not the greatest T argument, but obviously Plantex is important to think about T. The, so right now we have a bad T argument. We have some solvency takeouts and turns, which are good, right? Uh, and then sort of impact defense. The next thing to think about is sort of off-case positions that link to this. So remember, we talked about sort of a K triangulation. You can attach a K to whatever your you know, soft left team critique is. You know, it might be settlerism, it might be psychonauts, it might be Adorno. Uh, if it's a child, it's always a door note, but let's not have it always be a door note, right? So some sort of thing in the K-triangulation. The, and then you should have a specific strategy to what they have suggested. So the main sort of way that you can compete in this debate is that there's frankly no defense of decentralizing uh, offshore wind energy. There is evidence that says we should have decentralized wind uh, there's evidence that says we should have offshore wind. There's not evidence that's like minority communities live in the ocean and they must have decentralized offshore wind. Like that's just factually inaccurate, right? So it's possible to create sort of counterplan arguments, for example, that you know maybe we should develop offshore wind projects, but decentralization fails, or we should have decentralized onshore wind, so we should just not do it in the ocean, right? Maybe having Wind in the ocean kills the biodiversity of the animals there. That's a specific sort of pick argument that you can make to answer the the plan, right? And those are sort of difficult for um, the affirmative to answer. Uh, you might also have specific disad arguments. So you might have disads um, to just offshore wind generally. You might also have DAs to the notion of decentralization, right? Those are arguments that you should cut that are obviously not in our generics that can create the possibility for um, a good native strategy. So that, you know, gives you, you know, a pretty healthy four often case, right? T, uh, critique that's generic that you can fall back on if everything went terribly, right? A counter plan or pick argument that's pretty specific to the F with the net, but with a net benefit, and like a DA, and then pretty good case turns, right? Good case take S that are all, you know, good alt cause arguments that are just factually true, and a couple of turns arguments, right? Uh, that's like a good one in C. So when you think about soft left affirmatives, right, it's important to, so as I said, it's important to look at whether or not it solves or the degree to which it solves. It's important to look at the impact tricks and then think about sort of the off-case positions that make sense in your debate to sort of have some sort of consistent strategy. 
Uh, any uh, questions up until this point? Uh, if not, I'm going to talk like five minutes about the WhatsApp and then call it a day, if that seems reasonable to you all. Sure. Okay, uh, so the Vatsaf is an Oakton affirmative. Oakton likes to read random scientific technologies that are entirely implausible and don't work um, because those have a lot, not very much negative evidence. So that's sort of seen in their really bad olivine affirmative, which was just like literally throw like crystals of olive oil into the ocean and hope for the best, see what happens, uh, which is downright moronic. The other affirmative that they have is they have like essentially a different time of offshore wind offshore wind that sort of works like a fan that they it's called like VATS V A W T S uh, which they try to float in the ocean. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, Rahul found evidence that it sinks in the ocean, which is great uh, and embarrassing. Uh, but it's sort of important, and you know the way that you think about that F too is similar, right? You think about the solvency question, so you should be like. Do VATs actually end environmental injustice? Like, do like do we no longer drive cars? That like, are we just going to have like decentralized offshore? Or, sorry, do we have offshore wind energy cars? Like, is that a thing? No. Uh, is China going to shift? No. Right. These are all questions that where the answer is no, and you should be making solvency arguments. You also need to answer the impact tricks. They have two sets of impact tricks. They have one argument that structural violence outweighs, which is actually a pretty okay argument that you need an answer to. They make a really stupid argument that you know racism leads to spirit murder, which I did not think was an argument that anybody made since the 80s, uh, but we also need an answer to that argument, right? So you need to answer sort of their impact trick argument so that you don't get dinged on ethical like obligation or decision rule, uh, because that would be sad. Uh, the Next thing you should do is then think about off-case strategies that make sense. So think about a critique for a soft left affirmatives or, or sort of their you know soft left global warming affirmative. Think about a counterplan or dissent that's specific. It doesn't seem like VOTS has a U.S. key warrant, right? Like China could build, build world VOTS. Uh, there's frankly no reason why the United States needs to. Uh, there is also probably a counterplan that you should not do VOTS because VOTS sinks in the ocean. Uh, and maybe we should have a version of offshore wind energy that does not sink, uh, and then read a dissent to VATS. Uh, how do you answer a structural violence that way? It's a couple things. Um, you always need, a, you probably need a util argument in this debate. Util argument cuts through both sort of their um, racism and spirit murder argument and that structural violence that way. There's also pieces of evidence that say that um, war would intensify structural violence. So obviously it reads on the dissent you're reading, but let's say you read um, let's say you read the sacred cow dissent, which ends in the economic collapse, right? Um, you can make arguments that are like a world where a bunch of countries are going to war is probably a world where there would be more sort of structural violence and poverty, right? Like there would be, like people would lose their homes because of war, etc. There's also a decent argument, like turns case arguments, that if the economy goes into a slump, the first people that are going to get, they're going to get, you know, boned are poor people. Right, uh, so you can make sort of you know turns case arguments as well as like util style arguments that are like extinction outweighs as as well as like war turns structural laws. These are all sort of like different avenues that um, you have. Uh, so it's sort of you know so sort of use sort of the metric that or use sort of the you know set of arguments that I talked about. So solvency presses, impact trick arguments you know deal with those and then figure out the off case strategy and that's sort of the way that you should deal with. Their Oakton Vots F as well as TJ's Water F, which is basically a copy paste of TJ's Water F from one year ago, which is a copy paste from TJ's Water F from two years ago. So these are all, you know, the way that you think about negative strategies should be relatively the same for these kinds of affirmatives. Does that make sense? Any questions? Uh, what are strategies that one can use to make soft left AFs look bad in cross X? Uh, fair enough. I think a good way to, I think an important thing that you should question is solvency, 
for these affirmatives. So obviously, you know, the cross-sex strategy that's just like, wow, it seems like your impact is small and insignificant is not a very ethos strategy, cross-sex strategy, because obviously poverty and structural violence are important things in the world. Uh, it kind of seems like you're a dick if you're like, wow, there's only like 10,000 people who suffer. Uh, but I think the best way to sort of go about is to literally just press solvency arguments. Like, you should present all cause-ish arguments in your cross-sex. Like, you should be like, China still pollutes. Why does offshore wind energy or VAT uh, that the United States fund do, do anything to offset that? Uh, you know, there's a lot of oil dependence based off of cars and whatnot. How do we use offshore wind energy to, you know, you know offset those? Uh, you can also ask questions about sort of their impact level trick arguments. So you might ask arguments, so if you're unsure as to what their impact is. A good example of this that you can actually probably make fun of them for is, you should be like, what is spirit murder? And um, why is that a decision rule, right? Then you probably have trouble explaining what spirit murder is or in any credible fashion explain it to anybody, right? Uh, so those are sort of questions that you should ask. So obviously you should not be asking about like the scope of the impact, right? So you should not be like, that's not an impact, but you should be, Asking questions that are like, you do not solve that impact, or your like phrasing for your rhetoric for that impact seems problematic or strange or you know not credible. So those are sort of the questions that you should be asking. Any other questions? Okay, uh, three more things before I leave. Um, if you have not gotten the flyer about debate camps, please get them from Joey. Um, yeah. Uh, if you have questions about what camps to apply to, you should email me. Uh, my email is literally my first name and last name at gmail.com. Uh, you should probably do that. Uh, so obviously you don't need to do this like immediately, uh, but most of these camps have like essentially a March deadline. Uh, that each camp is different, obviously, but they have deadlines for a reduced rate for their camp, so it makes sense to talk to your parents early so that you can figure out what your summer plans are and see if you actually want to go. Uh, if debate camp is not, like, an option for you, right, like you need to go do something else, there is an internship or whatever, uh, try to sign up for that digital debate camp stuff because I'll be in it and uh, you'll at least have um, sort of a head start on the topic. And even if you're, it's sort of based on a fairly flexible schedule. So you should get that. That's one. Uh, the second is that I am going to post optional assignments. Um, optional assignments. Essentially, um, there are a couple people in that in this room that are interested in national competition. Um, that requires a substantial, you know, amount of work that you know regional and state people don't need. So obviously, if like regional and state people just need to do like ten minutes of speaking drills and occasionally give a speech. Right. Uh, there needs to be a consistent effort to do that by national folks, uh, or sort of the film study stuff even, right? So I'll be posting an optional assignment sometime later tonight uh, on the Facebook group for people who are interested. Do not feel pressured or feel the need to do it, but if you are actually interested in doing it, you should do it. Uh, the third is, so obviously this time is more of an intro lecture. So obviously, I think everybody to a degree knows what probability, magnitude, and time frame is. If not, ask Joey uh, and Michael and Ritwick and Rahul to explain it to you in the meeting preceding next week's one. But sort of advanced impact comparison is sort of one thing we'll talk about. And we'll have a discussion group about um, how to beat, uh, I think it's how to beat non-topical affirmatives next time, uh, or maybe it's something else. But we'll have a discussion group. If there is a particular affirmative or negative team that you are debating, uh, that you have sites for, that you have questions for, shoot me an email and we can make a discussion group about that. Otherwise, I will literally pick a random team that is attending a tournament nearby uh, to, you know, do sort of our, you know, dismantling of. So, okay. Well, thanks for coming. Um, see you sometime next week, unless Joey says there are any, there's any other sort of questions or concerns. Great. See you, everyone.